Good morning to you, and as always, let me warmly welcome you to our worship of God here at Gilcomson this Sunday morning. It's a delight to have you with us and to have you sharing with us in our worship of God this morning. So wherever you are, and I know that uh, some of you are here in Aberdeen, some of you much further afield as well, but uh, wherever you are, we're glad that you're able just to converge in this manner and to join in the worship of God. Let's then join to worship God and sound out his praise in the singing of the song, O Lord our God, how majestic is your name. Let's bow now together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Our gracious God and Father, how glad we are of the opportunity again this Lord's Day to still ourselves, to quieten our hearts and to come into your presence and to do so together in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're glad, our Father, always to have our eyes once again directed to yourself, to be reminded even in our opening praise of who you are and all that you have wrought for us in the person of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Glad in the knowledge that you are our great creator God, that the world in which we live was framed by yourself. You called it into being and you hold it all together. In all its vastness, there is that extraordinary order. There is that enormous variety, and there is just the most stunning beauty. And we delight in yourself in the knowledge that you do all things well. You're wise, you're good, you're strong, you're kind, and in all things, you are utterly righteous. 
You always do that which is right. You see the big picture rather than some shortened and uh, uh, tiny little fraction of the whole picture. You uh, view the thing in the long term and you know where you are headed. You have a purpose that is altogether good, a purpose that reveals your full glory, a purpose that enriches our lives beyond measure, and that purpose, you declare, is focused in the person of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, our Father, for all that he is, for all that he came to do, for all that he has accomplished in the life that he lived from an embryo onwards, as one of us to be for us all that we could never be ourselves, to live for us that life of matchless obedience, then to suffer in his own body the consequences of our lack of righteousness and endure the wrath of a holy God upon our sin. We don't presume upon that, our God. We allow your Holy Spirit to impress the enormity of that upon our hearts, that he has come in order to remove from us that which otherwise was a great burden that would have sunk us completely for all eternity, consigned us to hell itself. And how we thank you, our Father, that he has lifted that burden by and for us and thank you that by raising him from the dead, you underlined for us that his work was complete, that there was nothing more to be paid, nothing more to be done, and that in him, therefore, we, no matter who we are, what our background is, what our baggage is, we may enjoy your complete lasting forgiveness. You call us in him into your family, into a new future, into a new life. And by your Holy Spirit, you come and make us new men and women and girls and boys. We bless you for that, our Father, and seek thus in bringing to you the worship of our hearts once again to lay ourselves before you and to declare to you our gracious God, we are yours twice over, yours by dint of creation, yours by dint of that saving work of your risen Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear us, living God, in the praise that we bring. Hear us as we confess to you the multiplicity of ways in which we have gone astray and done our own thing and sinned against yourself. It's often been in what we've said, often in the choices that we've made, the actions in which we've engaged, the conduct that has been the hallmark of our living, the attitudes that we've adopted, the thoughts that we've entertained. Our Father, we are those who stand in need always of your forgiveness. And therefore, we draw near to you this day in our worship humbly, but thankfully, in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and pray that our worship may indeed be pleasing to yourself and honoring to your name. To that end, grant the help of your Holy Spirit that all may be done in a manner that is fitting for your glory. And this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, we're going to turn to the Scripture now. So if you have a Bible to hand, you might like just to get it out. We're going to be reading from the Old Testament uh, this morning, although the, uh, the reason for so doing is bound up with that passage in Matthew chapter 2, the narrative of the wise men who came uh, ultimately to Bethlehem. But we're going to read from the book of Daniel, uh, towards the end of the Old Testament, and Matt is going to read the scripture for us. So without further ado, welcome Matt, and thank you for reading the scripture, and over to you. Good morning to you. This morning's reading is from Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 36 to 49. That's Daniel chapter 2, and starting at verse 36. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they lie, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. 
Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. Thus iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honour and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Amen. Thank you then, Matt. And good morning to you, girls and boys. Um, it'd be lovely to have you here with us, but uh, you're at home, I presume. And uh, I hope that uh, you'll find the material that we've got prepared for you today will be of help to you as you share with us in our worship. You'll find that material, as always, on our website. Uh, if you go to resources, click on that, and then down to Sunday School, then you'll find that little um, part of the website that has a note about the, the worksheet. And that worksheet relates to the passage that uh, Matt has just read for us. Um, it's about a um, dream that the king of Babylon had. So just a, a little bit of uh, a word about the, the worksheet to start with. The king had a bad dream, basically, and uh, needed someone to explain it to him. And Daniel uh, was the one who was able to explain to him what the dream was all about. And the dream, really, he was pointing to was the fact that uh, there would be a kingdom coming that would last forever. And so he was pointing forward to a great king who was still to come. Nebuchadnezzar was a, a pretty amazing king in a lot of ways, a very powerful king indeed. But Daniel was reminding him through the dream that, uh, that actually there's a king coming who is altogether greater and better. And uh, so you, you have there a note of the, the kind of key verse for you to try and remember today. The God of heaven uh, will set up a kingdom uh, that will never be destroyed. And that, of course, is the kingdom that Jesus has come to bring in. He brings us into a new realm, a new kingdom that lasts forever. And so that's the worksheet. I hope that you'll enjoy working your way through the worksheet. That is, as always, the material that's been prepared for you for the Sunday School. All the Sunday School will be doing that. Uh, on the Beatitudes again from the big book of questions and answers. And Karen's prepared the material today. And uh, that's on the, the Beatitude when Jesus said, blessed are you. And uh, he, he's talking here about blessed are you that mourn. And Karen will work you through that today. So I hope on the, the website you'll find uh, a lot there that uh, occupies your attention and that helps you to uh, learn more about the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, place your trust in him. 
And uh, I thought we would sing now a song that, uh, that points us to him, I See the King of Glory. And that really is our intention always in all the material that we run past you. It's to help you to see the King of Glory more and more clearly and learn to trust him for yourselves as you grow up. So we'll join in the singing now of I See the King of Glory. Let's then bow together again in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, how we need to have our eyes lifted off the world in which we live and all that goes on around us in these turbulent days of change and crisis and directed to the one who is the King of glory the one who does reign, the one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given, you declare, and who rules with wisdom, with patience, and with grace. And we thank you, living God, that we may indeed look to yourself in these days as the one who is both creator and king, the God who has compassion over all that he has made, and to look to you to be our help, to be our strength, to be our salvation. We need you, our Father. We acknowledge that need in the face of all that is going on in the world in which we live in these days, as whenever we seem to begin to get a handle on this pandemic, something else happens that simply winds the whole thing up and makes it more virile. And we're humbled, living God, in the knowledge that we are but creatures, very finite in terms of our understanding, very finite in terms of our abilities, very finite in terms of our power. And you are the infinite God, 
There is no limit to your understanding, no limit to your knowledge, no limit to your power. You are able to do all things. And how we thank you, Heavenly Father, for every demonstration that you have given down through the centuries, that that indeed is precisely who you are and how you work and what you do. And we thank you, our Father, for the testimony of those who have gone before us, those who narrate, as we find in the Scriptures, of the intervention of the Most High God as you step into our history and you deal with our problems and you meet our needs in the most remarkable, wonderful ways. And how we thank you, our Father, that that's never simply something from the past, but is taught us that we might learn that you remain the same today as you have always been and you will remain the same throughout eternity. And therefore, we too, may look to you, may turn to you, may cry out to you and find you also stepping into our lives, stepping into our world in these days to meet us in our need, to resolve that which seems incapable of resolution. And so we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your goodness towards us in your risen Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, our Father, for the assurance you give to us that the reason you sent him into this world is because of the love that you have for this world, the desire that you have that we should know life, not death, that we should experience the light of your own presence rather than the darkness of our own shoddy and tawdry lives. And how we thank you, our Father, that having accomplished all that you sent him into this world to accomplish, your Son is now risen and has poured out his Holy Spirit upon his people that we might live in the power of your Holy Spirit, new lives, lives that are illumined by the knowledge of your presence, the assurance of your love, lives that are illumined and empowered by the grace of your Holy Spirit, as day by day he leads us forwards and onwards and upwards in the assurance that we will indeed be brought through every trial, every trouble, and brought safely to your heavenly kingdom. And so we thank you, our Father, for your every kindness to us, your every mercy to us, every provision that you make for us in the face of all our different circumstances. And together we cry out to you for those who are in particular need at this time, how aware we are, our Father, of those who are ill, those who are laid low, those who are infirm, those who are struggling with the aloneness, the isolation, the confinement over these past 10 months and more. We cry out to you, our Father, for those who find themselves under enormous stress, on account of the demands of their work, the responsibilities they bear, the decisions they have to make, the tasks that they have to fulfill, and the little time that is afforded to them for any measure of rest and relief at all. We pray, Father, for those who are mourning the passing of loved ones from this earthly life, those who feel profoundly the great vacuum that that bereavement has brought in their experience. And even as we see the figures paraded before us day after day on the television screens of how many, again, have died on the back of a positive coronavirus test, we're reminded, our Father, that in each single instance, there's a multiplicity of bereavement experience. And so we pray that you would comfort all who mourn, sustain all who struggle, heal those who are ill, and grant, loving God, that your hand may indeed be reached out in kind mercy to provide for the needs of those whose resources have dwindled, who hardly know which way to turn those who have been made redundant, those who have no income, those who have no food, those who find themselves struggling in the face of a pandemic with poverty and oppression and cruelty on top of all these things. We pray, our Father, for our rulers, all the more burdened so to pray in the light of the events of the past week, particularly in America, and recognizing just how fragile 
our whole society is from top down. And what need there is, our Father, for that gracious provision from on high of a wisdom and a measured discernment in the exercise of the responsibilities of government on the part of those who are called to that high office in our land and throughout the world. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that in your kind mercy in these days when the pandemic itself spread such a powerful swathe of death and disease, we pray, living God, that in your mercy you would both halt the spread of that virus and restrain the spread of that which would occasion division and violence within our societies in these days. God, our Father, have mercy upon us, we pray you. And as in the quietness of these moments, we bow before yourself and lay before you the burdens of our hearts. We remember particular individuals whose needs weigh heavily upon our hearts at this time and commend them by name to yourself. Joining with one another, our Father, in the prayers that we each offer to yourself, and asking that you would hear us for the sake of your own Son and for the glory of your own name, as together we bring these prayers before you and land them before you with a resounding Amen on our hearts. Hear us, our Father, we pray you, and bring glory to your own name and the answers that you give. For we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, as we turn in a moment or two to the Word of God again, we're going to make the words of our next praise our prayer as we turn to the Word of God. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you.
Well, as we turn to the, the Word of God, um, it is the book of Daniel that will be the, the main focus of our thinking this morning. Um, but the backdrop to that really is the, the narrative, as I mentioned earlier, in Matthew chapter 2, where he records for us the coming of the wise men, the magi, from the east to Jerusalem, first of all, and then to Bethlehem. And, uh, and really over the, the course of these weeks, what I, I'm hoping that we're able to do is, is look at that particular narrative of the Magi from the East coming to Jerusalem and see in it, in many ways, a helpful picture of how it is that people come to Jesus. Because in essence, that's what the story is about. And in some ways, that's why Matthew places it right there at the opening of his gospel account. That's his concern that people should come to Jesus. And so as we work our way through this, um, it is, first of all, important for us to understand how it is that people uh, take that first step towards Jesus. And uh, so we'll look at the, the story of the wise men and uh, see why it is that they were prompted to come to Jesus. That really is, is my burden for these next months, that there should be many who do take that step and come to Jesus, come to know him, come to enjoy him, come to meet him, come to welcome him into their lives and discover that long before they took that step towards him, he took the step towards them. And this narrative of the wise men from the East is, is very deliberately framed in those terms by Matthew because in the scriptures, the East is the place of banishment, is the place where you're at a distance from the Lord. It's the place uh, of exile. It's the place where you are put and where you find yourself on account of disobedience. You are away from God. And here are people coming from the East and coming to discover in Jesus the one in whom there is life. And that's, that's why this narrative is so integral a part, not only of the Christmas story, but of the whole gospel account itself. It is what God means we should all be doing. And so we started last Sunday uh, considering uh, what it was that prompted these uh, magi to come from the east to Jerusalem. And obviously basic to that was the activity of God himself. It's God who stirs people, God who prompts people like that. We uh, have been learning that in the book of Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 1, verse 5. It was the Lord who stirred up uh, the heart of Cyrus. It was the Lord who stirred up the people who were there in Babylon to take that journey to Jerusalem again all those centuries before these magi did. And it was uh, the Lord who stirred up the people to apply themselves to the work of the temple. And we recognize that the, the primary uh, action in all of this is, is God himself. It is God who puts it in people's hearts to take that step to seek after the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize that. But at the same time, we also recognize God uh, as the creator uses means. He, he doesn't uh, operate in the realm of magic. He doesn't simply snap his fingers, say abracadabra, and boom, there you have it. He tends to use means, and all the way through the scripture, that's underlined for us. And there are certainly means that he employs here. I think in some ways that that's what Paul was on about um, when he spoke uh, to the, the people in Athens. Uh, he said this, from one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. And God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. I think what Paul was on about there was a recognition that, that God does use events that happen in history so that we live at a particular time in history with a particular set of circumstances going on around us. And, and those events that uh, uh, take place in our history are used by God to prompt us to seek after him. And he sets us in particular places so that the things that we are able to see, the particular vantage point that our location provides for us, prompts us again to seek after God. 
Um, in, in many ways, that would be an integral part of the Lord's dealings with me as an 18-year-old. Uh, he took me to uh, a, a part of the world in southern Africa, and uh, the, the sight of things that I was seeing there, the, the visual impact of that was a part of what prompted me to seek after this God. And, and that's what Paul, I think, is recognizing. God uses means, and there's certainly uh, means that he uses in the case of uh, the Magi from the East. And, and it's that that I want to explore with you this morning so that we're able to learn some of the lessons from that. A word or two, first of all, about the Magi themselves. Um, perhaps to dispel a few um, myths to start with. Uh, we, we get it into our heads that there were the three wise men, and there, there may have been three wise men. Um, there may well have been a lot more than three wise men. We're not told at all how many there were. We simply come to that conclusion, or the song has come to that conclusion, because there were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but there's no, no indication that that means there were three of them at all, nor is there any indication at all that they were kings. The reason why uh, the, uh, the Christmas carols sometimes refer to them as kings, I think, is bound up with uh, words that we find in Psalm 72, for instance. At verse 10, may the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. And Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6, herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. And, uh, and so the conclusion drawn from these by people is, well, the, they came from Sheba, they brought gold and they brought incense, and the people that come in came from Sheba, Psalm 72 says they were kings, so these must have been kings. Um, forgetting that uh, that's actually poetic writing and uh, these individuals are indeed representatives of the Catholic, as Matthew puts it, Magi. It's very difficult for us to provide a, um, a simple single translation of that. Um, they were um, wise men. That's essentially what the, the Magi were. Not in the sense that they had a kind of uh, high IQ and qualified for Mensa, which I think is about the top 2% of the population uh, in terms of IQ qualify for Mensa. It doesn't mean uh, that they were wise in that sense. It doesn't mean that they had a whole load of initials after their letter, after their name because of the degrees that they had and the, uh, the, the doctorates that they'd accomplished or anything like that. Um, it simply means that they were in individuals whose, whose whole vocation in life and whose whole energies in life were poured into the pursuit of knowledge, um, a particular category of individual in the ancient world of whom that was uh, true, that was their vocation. They were the magi, they were those whose pursuit was of knowledge and they, they utilized really every, every discipline, I suppose, that we would associate with the pursuit of knowledge in that. So they, they looked at the skies, they looked at the stars, they were, they were not really astronomers, they were not really astrologers, but they, they accompanied all that they were doing by, by viewing the, the entirety of the world around them like that. They, they watched the skies, they watched what was going on in history, they read the books, they read from right across the spectrum of the, the, the learning that uh, others had brought to them. And so they, they, they were those who were pursuing knowledge, that's essentially who they were. And it's, it's important, I think, for us to, to recognize what was going on here in order that we might understand that um, the means that God uses, broadly speaking, are his providences on the one hand and his people on the other. And so when you ask the question, why did the Magi come to Jerusalem? They tell you the answer. And the answer is in a single one-liner. Uh, we saw the star. We saw his star uh, in the east, and that's why we've come, they say. And, and we're so familiar with that, we, we don't actually dig a little bit behind that and ask questions about that and say, well, okay, you saw a star, but, but how come that prompts you to take that huge and costly journey? What lies behind that simple statement that they saw the star, therefore they came? And, and it's that that I want us to 
uh, give consideration to. And it's that really which drives us back to the book of Daniel. There were really on the part of these wise men uh, two important ingredients. And this is where it's, it's helpful for ourselves uh, to, to recognize what was going on with them. There was, first of all, their observation. And then secondly, there was their expectation. Now, their observation uh, is itself quite illuminating. They observed the world around them. They observed what was going on in the world around them. They observed events and they observed the whole universe itself. And they did so because their understanding was it is a universe. There is an order to the world in which we live. It is not just a random collection of atoms that are floating around and, and who knows what's going to happen next because there is no pattern, no rhythm, no routine. Um, they recognize there is an essential and integral order to the world in which we live and to the cosmos within which this particular planet is placed. They didn't understand it in its entirety. They weren't uh, uh, familiar with all the ins and outs of uh, exploration of Mars and things like that, but they, they don't understand it. it is a universe. There is a certain cohesion, and so they observed that world and the understanding that, that there is a certain pattern uh, to all that goes on. There is a certain reason for all that goes on, and Paul speaks in those terms at the start of uh, his letter to the Romans in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. He, uh, he speaks there about the way in which what may be known about God is plain. God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen. Um, you open your eyes, it's there in front of you. That's his point. And, and that was the point in, in behind these, these magi. They, they were observing the invisible qualities of God. They were aware of the reality of God, aware of the workings of God, and aware that that world um, indicated to them certain things about what were going on in history. And so when they saw this bright star uh, out there in the, the ordering of the, the, uh, the living God, they recognized this unusual phenomenon indicated to them, and whether they were right or wrong to, to draw this connection is neither here nor there in a sense. This is, this is what lay behind their, their, their movement, their coming to Jerusalem. They observed something that was unusual in the, the, uh, the skies above, and they concluded that something unusual and significant was happening in the world in which they lived. Uh, that was their, um, their conclusion from their observation. Now, that observation by itself was, uh, was not complete. That observation was, was packaged with an expectation. And it was that expectation that was born out of uh, what we read in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 took place a long, long time, hundreds of years prior to this. Uh, God is not in a hurry, but he puts things in place that play their part down the line in the experience of others. And the expectation of these wise men, in many ways, derives from something that happened hundreds of years earlier in Babylon, in the east, during the time of Daniel. Daniel and his three companions had been taken into exile as uh, teenagers by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And they were very uh, able young individuals. They were... Um, uh, very well educated young individuals, very capable in many ways. And early on in their time in Babylon, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a bad dream in the providence of God. Um, that's where what we read about the wise men coming from the east to worship Jesus, that's where it originates. It goes right the way back to a providence of God whereby the king of Babylon had a bad dream. Um, and the early part of the chapter uh, narrates that. The king woke up and he was troubled, deeply troubled by the dream that he'd had. He didn't understand the dream that he'd had. He didn't understand the implications of it. He just knew that it had some significance, but he couldn't figure out what the significance was. And so he called all his wise men, all the magi. He called them all to him and he asked them, number one, tell me what I dreamt. If you're wise men, if you are uh, got a hotline to the God, if you know these things, then you should be able to tell me what I dreamed. And secondly, having told me what I dreamed, tell me what it means. 
And they immediately, arms in the air, said, you are asking the impossible. None of us is able to tell you what you dreamt. What happened in your dream is between you and, and your maker. Uh, we haven't a clue what happened there. And the king put his foot down and said, if you are wise men, you should know the answer to this. You should tell me. And if you don't, um, then that's it. Kaput. Your heads are off. Uh, end of the line for you. And uh, um, Daniel uh, heard about this. And he intervened on behalf of the wise men and said, uh, uh, give me a day and uh, uh, we, will, we will seek God over this and he will give to us the dream. And that's what he did. He got his three friends to join him in praying. They had a night of prayer and they asked God that he would, he would explain to them and reveal to them what was the dream that the king had and what was the significance of it. And uh, to the praise of God, that's what happened. Uh, wonderfully, Daniel was overjoyed over, over the moon in relation to this. God gave to him the uh, content of the dream and the meaning of the dream. And so alongside a, a bad dream, you have a bold believer. Um, this is the, the, the combination of uh, providences on the part of God that, that he put in place that will issue eventually in these wise men taking that extraordinary step and coming to Jerusalem. Uh, a bad dream, and then a bold believer. Daniel really put his head on the line on this one. He said, uh, King, um, I, I know that no one can tell you what, to, what the content of a dream is, but God can, and I, I trust this God. And so in boldness, he said, uh, leave it with me. And he came back to the king and told him what the dream was. King, you saw a massive statue. A uh, head of gold, chest of silver, uh, and all the way down the bronze, down to the iron and clay uh, down at the bottom. And then he explained to the king what the significance of the dream was. You are the head. You are the gold head. You are a great king and a great kingdom. And after you will come another kingdom. It won't be quite as powerful, but it will be another kingdom. And after that, another kingdom. And after that, a further kingdom. And then eventually this rock that there was, that was uh, um, not from any humanity at all, this rock would come and be a kingdom that would last forever. And, uh, and he told the king the meaning of the dream. And that's what Matt was reading for us, the uh, significance of the dream. And uh, the king was, uh, was stunned, first of all, by the fact that this man was able to tell him precisely what the dream was that he had, and then was able to explain it to him with such clarity. And uh, that saved the lives of these wise men. It saved the lives of this whole guild, this whole fraternity of the Magi in Babylon. And you can well imagine and understand, therefore, that Daniel was held in the highest regard. This was the man who had saved their lives. Um, and that's underlined for us. And, and through the course of Daniel chapter 2, of course, um, mention is made again and again of the wise men, the wise men, the magi there. Their lives were saved by Daniel, by his ability under God to, to discern what the truth was, his ability to explain that to the king. And the message that he brought was the message of this great king that would come and a kingdom that was coming that would be from uh, to everlasting, that would endure forever. And in many ways, as the years went by, and this teenage boy grew up and, and assumed that role, he's given that uh, very prominent role as being head of all the wise men, so he is heading up this whole fraternity of those who are pursuing knowledge. He is heading that up and down through the years, down through the decades for some 60 years or so, he is exercising that ministry. And in some ways, he embodies precisely the truth that he's been declaring. There will be a king and a kingdom that will last forever forever. And, and so that is deeply ingrained into the mindset of these wise men uh, in the East, the Magi, down through the centuries, this conviction that there will be a king coming, uh, a kingdom that will last forever. Uh, and they, they come from a society where the whole notion of kingdom has been an integral part of their whole perspective. There's the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, a great powerful kingdom. And then the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians that would follow, and the, the, the Roman civilization, the Greek civilization, these, these powerful empires that would rise up. They are familiar with this notion. That's their, their kind of working habitat. 
and, and hears this message about a kingdom that is coming that will last forever. And so there, there is that expectation on their part of a kingdom that will be coming. And so they are on the lookout down generation after generation of these magi there. There is this expectation that a king will come. And therefore, when they observe the, the unusual uh, star in the sky with this unusual brightness, recognizing there is a certain cohesion to the whole cosmos in which they live and see that bright, unusual star there. And they, there is in the back of their minds the awareness that there, there is this promise of a king that is coming. And, and they would doubtless, through Daniel, have been familiar with the, the prophecy of, of uh, Balaam in the Old Testament in Numbers chapter 24, where he speaks about a star rising out of Israel. Uh, the, the one who would wear that scepter, the one who would be the king, uh, they are putting two and two together and they are coming to the conclusion, this is the moment in history. And that's how the Lord prompted them. Through the providence of a bad dream, a bold believer and a big, big message that had kind of lodged in the consciousness of the people of Babylon and in particular that fraternity of the Magi. God put all of those in place. Uh, he, he ensured the king had that bad dream. He ensured Daniel was there to bring that interpretation in the boldness of a young believer trusting God that God would reveal the dream to him and a big message that had been landed in Babylon, placed there through the exile uh, those centuries earlier. Um, God uses means and his providences that prompt people to, uh, to, to do the maths, to observe what is going on in the world, to recognize alongside that expectation that there must be something better. There is surely something good that is to come. Uh, combining the two in a way that prompts people to start seeking after God. And it may well be that uh, um, the present events in the world in which we live are what the Lord uses in the experience of some to make them stop and think. Is, 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 is there not some, some reason for all that is going on? What, what is the reason of it? What is life all about? What is the world coming to? When all the, the basic uh, foundations upon which our living have been based seem to be shaking at the very least and perhaps crumbling before our very eyes. What is, what is it all about? What does life mean? And that itself prompts people to come and seek after the one uh, who down through the centuries, whose name has endured, whose, whose message has endured, and who is flagged up as being the one who is king, uh, the one who rules and who rules well and wisely, and who brings an order where there is chaos, who brings light where there is darkness, who brings fullness where there is an emptiness. So there are the providences of God, and, and uh, along with that, I want also just to, to underline the people of God, the way that God uses people as well. Um, there's no doubt that a significant part of what prompted these magi from the east to come to Jerusalem was the influence of Daniel all those hundreds of years earlier. Um, the ministry that he exercised and the message that he brought were alike instrumental in uh, prompting these people to turn to Jesus and come to him. That's, that's worth uh, bearing in mind and pondering. The influence of this man all those centuries earlier had a lasting legacy and when you consider the, the ministry that he exercised, I think you, you're able in broad terms to, to recognize these five features about it. And um, these are the five things that I always ask people to pray for in regard to myself, for those who minister the word of God particularly. But it's true, I think, across the spectrum of all our lives an A, B, C, D, E, A for authority, B for boldness, C for compassion, D for discernment, and E for energy. Um, that's what characterized the ministry of Daniel. 
there was that authority about him. There was that boldness about him. There was that compassion. He, he had a care for the wise men. There was that discernment, his ability to understand, and there was that energy that enabled him to keep on going down through all the years. And that ministry, characterized thus, had a profound impact when it was coupled with a message, a message that was underlined by him. You read about it in chapter 7 as well, about a king whose kingdom would endure. And uh, that um, combination of the ministry this man exercised and the message that he so embodied and declared, just a king, Jesus is king. That combination used by God to prompt these men all those many, many years later to turn to uh, the uh, Lord Jesus Christ, to come to him. And <clears throat> I want to stress in closing just these two things uh, that I think are pertinent to ourselves today. Um, chapter 2 of Daniel, Daniel is a young man. He is, um, along with his friends, they were just teenagers, young teenagers, almost certainly, when they were brought from uh, Judah to Babylon. And as they were removed from Jerusalem, Judah, to Babylon, their whole life was disrupted in their young teenage years. And there's many... Uh, a youngster today who, who must feel something like that, that their whole lives have been profoundly disrupted by the pandemic and by the consequences of that. And the, the instinct is to conclude in the face of that that it's, it's kind of the end of the world, it's a, it's a disaster. Uh, and in some ways it was a disaster for Daniel and these three men, his three companions. Um, but nonetheless, God was pleased to take that providence whereby they were taken away from Judah, taken into exile, and that became far from being the end of the world. It was the means by which, centuries later, these magi came from the east to Jerusalem to seek after Jesus. And so if you are um, a young teenager and you are listening in this morning, sharing in our worship, pondering the word of God, then I, then I want you to see how significant, even in the face of the most disruptive, disturbing, unsettling, and uncomfortable experiences, how significant your testimony may indeed be. Um, Daniel was used by God to prompt others to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and opened the door in many ways for a multitude, opened the door to, to the whole East, as it were, to whole people outside of God to turn to him. And if that's true for young teenagers, then I want you to see this as well. Um, I want you to see that Daniel and his companions as young teenagers had already been well taught and well trained and well equipped behind them and behind the faith that they exercise in Babylon from an early stage is the instruction, the encouragement, the example and the, uh, the ministry of parents, of pastors, of mentors who have enabled them to have such a clarity in their grasp of the truths about their God, about who he is, what he does, how he works, that they were enabled with great boldness from an early stage in Babylon to bear witness to him in a way that would not only affect the life of Babylon itself in their day and generation, but hundreds of years down the line would impact others as well. Now, we know nothing about their parents. We know a little bit about the ministry of Jeremiah as he prepared the next generation for the eventuality of the exile and all the demands that that would bring. But behind the scenes, there is that ministry that has been exercised. 
And for those of you who are parents, believing parents, those of you who are involved in Sunday school and youth work, those of you who are in a position of being in some way or another a mentor, a, 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 a model for a growing generation of youngsters, those who are teachers, it may be, uh, I want you to see the, the huge significance that you may have in, in equipping a young generation for the demands and the challenges that will arise for them. Um, it's a remarkable story, this, the wise men, the magi coming from the east. Why? Because they saw the star. They observed what was going on, and they coupled that with the expectation that had been fed into their hearts by the ministry and the message of Daniel. And God used that to bring them to Jesus. And it may be that you are simply on the fringes of things, observing what is going on, out there in the world today, things going on in your own life, perhaps tragedies in your own life, perhaps problems in your own life, and, and observing it all, trying to make sense of it all. And it may well be that God prompts you as well through this to come to Jesus because it's in him that our life is found. So may he bless his word to that end in all our lives and all our different circumstances. And Father, as we, we round off uh, our study of your word, uh, thank you for um, the, the way in which you are pleased in your wise ordering of things to set things in place, to set a star in the sky at that right time, and long before that star was ever in the sky to have set in place that bad dream, the boldness of, of Daniel and the message that he proclaimed. And thank you for the ways that you work in our lives to stir within our hearts that, that longing, that expectation, that eagerness to find at last that which gives meaning and purpose and point to our lives. Would you grant, Father, that there should indeed be many in these days who do come to Jesus and find in him their life and help us, like Daniel of old, to bear that faithful testimony to his kingship for his name's sake we ask it amen well as our closing praise i thought we would take the words of, of a psalm that speaks in these terms and uh, sound out our praise to god the praises of the lord our god
Well, as always, it has been a pleasure to have had you share with us in our worship of God. I trust that it's been edifying for you and an encouragement to you. And as you press on out into all that these coming days will hold, may you go in the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ to love and to serve him in the confidence of his gracious kingship. Go then in peace and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.